Today on Artifactually Speaking, I talk about the Sela, the Bon, and the Bariga. Confused? Well, you're not alone. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, archaeologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm in the museum's Near East study room to talk about this particular object, which is enigmatic, even though it looks fairly simple. It's a barley party. Barley was probably the most important commodity in all of Mesopotamia. We've probably heard of the Neolithic or agricultural revolution, where people start to farm, to grow their own crops and to raise animals. Well, when they did this, they were able to create surpluses and those surpluses could feed more and more people, but they needed to know how much they had. So measurement, the control of and understanding of how much of a commodity you have is vital to be able to survive through winters, lean periods, etc. So measurement as standardization becomes more and more important we don't really understand the earliest measurement because it's before writing, but they are measuring before they start writing. Length and capacity appear to be the first ones, and then weight is the third. And we find that many of the measurements in Mesopotamia have as their basis the barley corn. So the width of a barley corn is the smallest unit measurable in Mesopotamian length, and the barley corn is also the smallest unit of weight. So they use these terms, but the terms get redefined through time, and so they do change. We will find heavy variants in the early periods, maybe less variants, but more definitions in the later periods, so they become extremely confusing. Weights have been something that I study for a long time because we find them in the archaeological record, I can test them. Volume is much more difficult. We get lots and lots of pottery. But most of the pottery was not made to a specific standard. It's hard to do. You make clay, it starts to dry so it shrinks a bit, it fires, it shrinks some more. So you wouldn't know when you made it what the end volume was really going to be. But the texts tell us that there are standard measuring vessels. Now these texts, Akkadian and Ur III in particular, a highly bureaucratic state, and so they have a lot of tablets that talk about administration and about measuring. How do you measure grain 4,000 years ago? And more than that, really. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. The texts tell us the system of measures, but they don't tell us how much each one is because, well, they didn't, they wouldn't know what a liter was, so they can't tell you the equivalent of a sila in terms of a liter. We have to try to find out and we have very few vessels to test. There was one found at Tel Rimach that had inscribed into it, so it had been scratched after the thing had been fired, that it contained, I think it was 121.3 sila. Well, that one was largely intact or it was able to be reconstructed. We had enough of it to know the vessel and they measured it and they came up with about 0.81 approximately, I think it was 0.807 liters to the sila. But that's kind of a going estimate, somewhere around 0.8 to 1 liter. There are some estimates that it's up to as high as 1.3, but it's in that range. I want to try to test this because I think it might be a standard volume of grain. Well, that needs some explaining because right now it is categorized as a drain pipe. And I think you can see why that would be. It is, well, it's hollow, it's straight through, and it was found beneath the floor of a temple. But it's not a drain pipe. At least that much I can guarantee. The drains that we find from this period, they're really about 50 centimeters in diameter, and they stack on top of each other. They're collars of sorts that then go straight down into the ground, and they often have holes in them because they're seepage drains. They, they get rid of the water into the soil or the waste products. It's how you make a toilet too. You put this straight vertical drain down and then you put a paving stone above with a hole in it because it needs to drain. Well, this was found with a paving stone above it with no hole. And it was sitting on top of another brick that had bitumen on it. It was going nowhere and it was draining nothing. It's not a drain. This is an Ur three 
vessel. There is no doubt about that. We can see that there is an inscription on the side of it, and that inscription is clear. We know what it says. It says, King Shulgi, strong king, mighty king, king of the four quarters of the universe. So we know that this was issued in the time of King Shulgi. So he was the second king of the Ur-3 dynasty, and he reigned for about 48 years. Why would he put his name on a drain pipe, first of all? And oh, okay, maybe he would, but it's pretty unlikely. It's something else. It's something special. Another one was found very near it. The similar thing, though. It was underneath the floor directly like this. Two drains very close to each other. At this size, no. And then three others were found, not too far away, but not in conjunction. This is not a drain pipe. We don't know what it is. But when Sir Leonard Woolley dug them, we have his field note cards, his catalog card for this object, says measure, question mark. And then it says two different sizes, 12 and 18 ka. Now, this is all very interesting because, well, we have this one size, and the two in the British Museum are apparently the same size or very close. So, we have five of these beneath a floor, and what they normally put beneath floors are votive objects, sort of dedications to a, a god. And in fact, we know this was a temple because also beneath the floor, well, at junctions of walls in three different rooms, there were five boxes. Inside of most, there was a foundation tablet that tells us what the building was and a statuette of the king. So these foundation deposits are quite important for us identifying a building because that tablet says that King Shulgi built this temple for his lady, Nimin Taba. It's only a partial temple. The walls are all cut down to foundation level, but we do have this paved room where these were found, and we have the foundation boxes. So it's a temple to a goddess that we know very little about. She could be some kind of guardian, but guardian of what? I want to see her as connected to Nisaba, and Nisaba is the goddess of grain. But I have no real evidence of that. I would like this to be a standard vessel for grain. Uh, we see that on some cylinder seals, there is an object being carried by grain gods. They're identified by the sheaves of grain coming from their shoulders. Most of these vessels that measured grain were made of wood. Sometimes we see ghee, which means reed. So some of them are made out of reeds. Those deteriorated in the archaeological record, so we don't find them. But what if they made some in clay? I think that this should be a one bon measure. Bon, also read sutu in the Akkadian, is 10 silas. And I think it's probably going to be about that range. Well, he said 12, but I don't know what he measured it with. So I'm going to try to fill it and see what we get. But there are other problems. How do you fill it all the way up to a heap or not? Well, the texts again tell us something about that. They tell us that sometimes a, a meshekum was used, and that is, I guess in the Greco-Roman world, it's called a strickle. A strickle, it's a flat piece of wood usually. I have plastic here, this is a, a ruler, but they use it to make sure that you're exactly flat. So you get rid of all of that extra. But there are different measures as well, and some of them might be the heap because it's about 5% greater. So I'm wondering, will a heap be 5% of the total value? And some have suggested that might be also the tax. You push that off, you give that to the state, and the rest of it goes for trade or, or whatever. There are texts that talk about the releasing of the grain heaps. And that was after harvest. You would take these bariga containers, which would be six of these, really, the size of six, and you would find out how much your yield was, and you'd have a scribe there, an administrator, writing down exactly how much was there. And most people, of course, think that it must have been a pot with a base. This doesn't have a base. But I think that that makes it easier to use and easier to show that you're not cheating as well. So you could fill this up and then raise it and you would get a heap of grain that has been measured exactly to one bond if this is a bond. So then if you were on a piece of cloth or a reed mat or something, you just wrap that up and take it away because you've got a pre-measured one bond sack or one bariga sack if you're using the bigger thing. And you can take that and trade it or what have you. So that's my idea. I'll set up and we will try to see what we get. All right, let's hope that I have enough grain. Uh, I've got 10 pounds. 
of raw barley. It is, well, it's not been processed, not greatly. So it doesn't have the whole, it certainly hasn't been pearl. It looks like we're not gonna make it, so I'm not even gonna know, unfortunately. We're very close. We're getting down to within five centimeters of the top. So, I might be able to do this, then another five centimeters to see what it would be. But first, I want to demonstrate what I think would work. Now, I'm going to be very careful here. Making this heap. There we go. We have a heap of grain. And if I had made it to the top, we would know that that was exactly what this contains. All right, well, more surprises. I only get about 6.33 liters in that 10 pounds. I would have expected about seven, 7.2, something like that from the presumed density of barley. And when I did the calculations, I, it showed me that I should get about 9.2 uh, pounds in here. But of course, that whole thing with the diameter not being constant has really changed it. But why there's so few liters, I don't know. But we've got to get that other five centimeters. So I've turned the thing upside down so that we can get that portion to make sure the top is that portion that we were missing. And I'm going to see if I can find five centimeters. I've got my ruler right down in there. And I'm going to see when we hit the five centimeters and level that out. This is not precise, not by any means. Close. There's another issue. We don't know if it was compacted when it was measured. There are some indications from the text that they have different ways. So perhaps a pouring from a higher height, which might get rid of more of the dust and compact it more in. And we don't really know what their exact method was. Well, I think that's the closest I'm gonna to get to five centimeters. I'm gonna make sure that all of this is cleared away. If I'd been able to strickle off the top, it would have all come down here to the base and I would have had to try to remove that to measure it and see if that was the extra 5% volume. People have studied grain a lot and they say the angle of repose is 36 degrees. So that would be, that would be the height of that heap before it had to just keep falling off. It would maintain about a 36 degree angle. So you could probably calculate what that would be. But, now we have the remaining portion, we hope, and we get our new uh, heap of grain. All right, looks like it's going to be almost exactly that one more. So another one and a half liters would put us to 7.8 or thereabouts. Possibly a little bit more because I've obviously mixed this up a little bit. But that could be a good measure. If it's a one bond unit, that's 10 sealants and each seal would be right around 0.8 liters. I hope you enjoyed looking at this possible grain measure with me, and I hope you'll join me again next time on Artifactually Speaking.